If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Luke chapter 9. So we continue our work through the gospel of Luke and the certainty of the gospel. I want you to think for a moment this morning about the deadliest enemy for the church. What poses the biggest threat? Is it a secular government? Is it a hostile culture? Is it the growing immorality that we see around us? Is it the threat of possible persecution? Well, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian who was executed by the Nazis during World War II, wrote, Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church. He described cheap grace as grace without price, grace without cost. And he went on to write, the essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in full. And because it's been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Instead of following Christ, let the Christian enjoy the consolations of his grace. This is what we mean by cheap grace. A grace that amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. And he writes, it's under the influence of this kind of grace that the world has been made Christian. But at the cost of secularizing the Christian religion as never before, the Christian life comes to me nothing more than living in the world and as the world and being no different from the world. You see, according to Bonhoeffer's concept of cheap grace, the Christian does not need to try to follow Christ, for cheap grace has freed us from that. You know, as I think about his words, his perspective, I've got to acknowledge that perhaps the greatest danger isn't from outside the church. Perhaps it is from within. Because we have largely drifted away from the biblical view of grace. Because in Scripture, grace is costly. And far from excusing us from discipleship, grace calls us to follow after Jesus. And personal encounters with three potential followers shed light on our call from Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, it says, As they were going along the road, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. These are shocking encounters between Jesus and three individuals. And yet in that encounter with the first would-be disciple, we see that the call of Jesus leads us to consider the cost. Verse 57 says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. 
This man impulsively volunteered to go with Jesus. No ifs or buts. Whatever the destination, wherever Jesus led, whatever Jesus asked, he would follow. This man came with respect, with enthusiasm, with noble intentions, offering himself as a permanent follower. And notice what Jesus said in response. The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Is that the response you would expect from Jesus? And why did he respond in such a way? Well, perhaps this would-be disciple was not aware of the implications of his commitment. Perhaps his claim was rather casual or flippant. So Jesus seemed to say to him, you don't really understand what you're saying. Before you commit to follow me, count the cost. Now, in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 32, Jesus offered up a couple of parables. The first related to the building of a tower and the absolute necessity of being able to see it through to completion. The second parable related to going to war. Engaging the capacity for victory in that conflict. Now, in both parables, the message was the same. Before initiating a great work or a great project, we should consider the cost. And this encounter in Luke chapter 9 emphasizes that following Jesus is no light matter. Jesus spoke of blessings that we could expect in following him. He, he pointed to and expressed the welcoming, forgiving, and saving grace of God. But he also spoke very honestly of how we're called to respond. Now, in our culture, I fear that we have often stressed the former to the neglect of the latter. Because it's possible to preach grace, forgiveness, and heaven, perhaps even with a little health, wealth, and happiness thrown in, without including the call to discipleship. But to do so is to peddle cheap grace by promising heaven to those who may not be interested in following Jesus at all. So this encounter stresses that following Jesus demands commitment. It demands more than words of affirmation or a little bit of enthusiasm. Following Jesus demands a willingness to commit and follow through. I took Greek at Hardin-Simmons University under the legendary Dr. Ray Ellis. Now, if you know Bill or Bob Ellis, this, this is their dad. The first day of class, he came in and he looked us over. There were about 14 of us sitting in the class at that time, and he said, half of you will be lucky to be in this class at the end of the semester. The other half will be lucky to have seats. Well, I mean, you should have seen the guy's eyes light up. He had that reputation as well, and, and he was right. <laughs> But what was he doing? Why did he come in the first day of class like that? Because he was asking us to step up to the challenge. That if taught well, language is hard because it's accumulative. You have to work. You have to stay focused. You have to be disciplined. You have to not fall behind on all your vocabulary and all of the declensions and things of the language. Well, today there is so much failure in follow-through. From weighty decisions such as marriage to everyday commitments, in anything demanding, enthusiasm and good intentions won't get the job done. In any sphere of life, 
We have to be confronted with the facts. See, when a young person sees the glory of the athlete and longs to become a ball player, the coach needs to confront him and say, are you prepared? Are you prepared for the self-discipline and the work that's going to be required? When a person sees the uniform of a soldier and the honor associated with serving one's country and sets his sights on going into the military, someone needs to say, are you prepared? Are you ready to make the sacrifices, embrace the discipline, and bear the possible costs? When a person observes the love, joy, and support of family life and desires to get married, someone must ask, are you committed to the relationship for better or worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do you part? You see, these statements by Jesus are not intended to discourage enthusiasm. They're meant to confront us with the reality of the demands required in following him. Because we know there's more to being an athlete than notoriety and riches. There's more to being a soldier than medals and honor. There's more to being married (laughs) than warm fuzzies and infatuation. In all of these, there must be steadfast commitment. And Jesus says the same is true in following him. D.A. Carson has written, Little has done more to harm the Christian witness of the church than the practice of filling its ranks with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession, talk fluently of experience, but display little of perseverance. So in this passage, Jesus slowed down this man's impulsive response and sought to lead him to consider the cost of following him. We may have done a great deal of hurt to the cause of Christ by letting people think that Christianity does not need to make so great a difference in our lives, when in reality, it ought to make all the difference in the world. We might have fewer people But those we have would be more than Christian in name. They'd be committed to Jesus. And that's what Jesus was seeking. And the call of Jesus leads us to consider the call that moves us to crucial decision. Verse 59 and 60. And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. This man wanted to put off the decision. Now, there's some discussion whether this man's father had already passed away or if he was elderly and he wanted to wait until after his passing. But he too had very noble intentions, and he makes a verbal commitment. He wanted to go. He said he would go with one stipulation, when the time is right. But when Christ calls, we're challenged to give Jesus priority. His response in verse 60 Allow the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Man, that was a shocking contradiction to Jewish piety. Burial was a religious duty, a long-standing tradition, taking precedent over any other responsibility. In that culture, only Nazarites and high priests were absolved from that duty. It was required by the law. But these seemingly harsh words were a desperate appeal to this man who had been drawn to Jesus. Jesus calls us to put him above any and every other responsibility. And somehow, 
Today we act as though this is something new or surprising. But remember the Ten Commandments? Number one, (laughs) you shall have no other gods before me. No gods beside me, no gods comparable to me, no gods competing with me for allegiance. Commitment to the Lord is to come first. You see, Jesus never sought followers on false pretenses. And we do disservice to the cause of Christ if we lead people to believe that following Jesus makes little or no demands on those who would follow him. He demands a commitment that is total and steadfast. And when God calls, we're challenged to follow him at once. For everything, there is a crucial moment. And if that moment is missed, most likely it's never done at all. I mean, how much fails to get done simply because we put it off? We think, I'll do it later. One of these days, tomorrow will be better, less busy. And what happens? (laughs) It doesn't get done at all. This would-be follower had received the call from Jesus. He had heard those wonderful words, follow me. And if he failed to seize the moment, the opportunity would be gone. See, God's grace is costly calling us to give him priority and to seize the moment because the call of Jesus moves us to a crucial decision. And the call of Jesus demands single-minded devotion. Look at verse 61. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to go say goodbye to those at home. This man called Jesus Lord and pledged to follow him. But notice he was seeking to do so on his own terms. For him, discipleship would be possible only after certain conditions had been met. This man claimed to place himself at the the disposal of the master. Yet he retained the right to dictate his own terms. (laughs) Now, think about what that means for a moment. To dictate the terms of our obedience means that discipleship is not discipleship. And the master is not truly the master. This man had arranged service to Jesus to suit himself. He placed himself in the position of master and Lord. And think about how often we so subtly do the same kinds of things. We say, I will follow you. But first, let me do this. But following Jesus demands that we place ourselves at his disposal. Jesus seeks no mere profession, no affirmation that calls him Lord. In fact, on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus denounced those who called him Lord, Lord, but failed to do what he said. Jesus called us to unreserved, unqualified, surrendered commitment. Verse 62, Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Now remember, they didn't have self-driving tractors back then, (laughs) guided by GPS. So the farmer had to remain focused on and dedicated to the work. Such single-minded devotion demands that we remain dedicated to the Lord. Self-interest and selfish concerns threaten to derail us at any moment. The things of this world can distract us. And we are forever tempted to push God to the side. We are tempted to relegate God to the times when we're not busy with our own plans and to offer God our leftovers in terms of time and money and gifts and resources. 
But Jesus calls us to complete and consistent devotion. And if our Christianity has ceased to be serious about discipleship, if we have watered down the gospel into emotional uplift that makes no costly demands and brings no change to our lives, then we have departed from the call of Jesus who leads us to consider the cost, moves us to a crucial moment, and demands single-minded devotion. You know, in Baptist life, we talk about being justified by grace. But the only people who have the right to say they're justified by grace are those who have given themselves to follow Jesus. When we use the term free to describe God's grace, we may get a distorted picture. Because when we hear the term free, we tend to think of something that's very cheap and very easy. And I want you to know this morning, God's grace is not cheap. And it's not easy. God's grace is costly because it costs God his son. And it's not easy because it demands from us our lives. Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it this way, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. Only the man who is dead to his own will can follow Christ. The men in this passage had the ultimate encounter with Jesus. They stood right in front of him. They heard his address. They heard his voice. They responded to his words. And the first asserted self-confidently that he would follow Jesus without awareness of what that would mean. The second sought to put off the decision to follow Jesus in favor of doing other things. The third sought to follow Jesus on his own terms. Let me do this first. So Jesus pointed out their misunderstanding regarding the nature of discipleship. And each of these would-be disciples was left with a decision. Each one was forced to make a choice. And this morning, so are we. If God is stirring in your heart this morning, now is the crucial moment. Will you make that decision to follow Jesus? Will you embrace him as Savior and what he's done for you and commit to follow him as Lord? Will you submit to him? Will you surrender to him? Will you walk in obedience according to his leadership? Perhaps this morning God is calling you for the first time to say, understand what I've done for you on the cross. Understand the forgiveness and grace I extend. But don't stop with understanding. Receive it by way of commitment that gives your life in response. And perhaps you're here this morning and you're a person of faith. But I tell you, it is easy to become distracted. It is easy to begin to look back and, and be concerned about so many other things that God is slowly and unconsciously relegated to the back burner. This morning as a believer, are you guilty of looking back? Maybe this morning God is calling you back to single-minded devotion to Him. To renew your commitment to follow after Him. Not only depending upon him as Savior, but following him as Lord. Will you renew that relationship of submission and surrender? Or perhaps this morning you're seeking a church home. A place to partner with fellow believers where we endeavor to grow closer to the Lord and closer to one another. 
embracing his call to follow him as master and Lord, submitting ourselves to him, and bearing witness to the world around us of the difference that he makes. Bearing witness in word and deed to the salvation Christ bestows. However, God may be leading you to respond this morning, whether there in your pew or here at the front, I invite you to respond as Sam comes to lead us in our hymn of invitation. Would you stand together as we sing hymn number 550, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Jesus.